Australia is drowning. Well, to some extent it is. Strange weather events have led to massive widespread floods all throughout the eastern parts of the country, along with a much colder and wetter winter. In the past couple of months, Victoria has become absolutely inundated by rains that seemingly never stop. Some places receive flooding that surpassed historical levels, and this is all because of a few things that have been going on, with one of them being an anomaly in this case. This anomaly is the massive volcanic eruption that occurred in Tonga in January of 2022. This was the largest eruption that we have witnessed since the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa. And this eruption is directly responsible for creating and amplifying the wave of devastation that Australia has experienced in the past few weeks, as floods affected vast areas of the country, plunging much of it beneath metres worth of water, and catching many suburban areas by surprise as rivers began to swell to historical levels within only a few hours of heavy rainfall commencing. The amount of rain that was experienced was seemingly endless, week after week where the channels would predict yet another rain bomb approaching the eastern states, forcing thousands of already worn down Australians to remain on high alert. So how did the Tongan eruption contribute to the amplification of these events? Well, it's a fascinating story, and it's one worth telling. The recent floods in Victoria were bad. Really, really bad. A flood emergency is looming with up to 100 millimetres of rain forecast to lash Victoria. We've actually broken records. 24 hour records are broken, but also we've had 48 hour records broken, including in Bendigo. You've got Mangalore in Victoria, 137 millimetres. That's a record. Data to 1957 at that site. Then you've got Bendigo, 117. They've got data to 1863. So more than 150 years worth of data. And for October, we've never seen that much rain. Volcanic eruptions have been known to be associated with climate impacts for a very long time. Only 200 years ago, Mount Tambora erupted at a scale that was unprecedented and that far surpassed the magnitude released by the Tongan eruption. This eruption created a living hell on Earth for a few years after it. Around 100,000 people, both near and far, would perish as a result of the circumstances that were triggered by this event. Temperatures dropped, crops perished and famines became widespread across the globe. The massive ash cloud that was released by Tambora launched a bombardment of sunlight reflecting aerosols into the stratosphere, which lowered the temperatures of the planet. Every part of the world was affected by this event. But the eruption that occurred in Tonga in January of 2022 was a little different. Unlike Krakatoa or Tambora, it didn't occur in the open air like these two notorious eruptions did. And that's a huge difference. It was primarily a submarine eruption meaning much of the sunlight reflecting aerosols remain trapped beneath the waves, and this has led to a few different things occurring. Firstly, the sun hasn't really been blocked all that much. Some aerosols definitely would have reached the stratosphere, but in general, most of it remains submerged. But one volatile in particular was released to unprecedented levels, and that's what has created the catalyst for the floods that we would eventually witness in Australia. This volatile was water. Yep, water. When this blast occurred, massive, and I mean massive amounts of water were shot up towards the stratosphere. The ash plume reached 58 kilometers above the surface and penetrated the stratosphere. This is the first time we've witnessed a volcanic eruption penetrating the stratosphere. In fact, the Tongan volcano generated the highest plumes of ash and water ever measured. But before we continue, we first need to touch on the normal factors that contribute to wetter weather in Australia. And these are cyclical and are a natural part of our continent. I'll try to get through this as soon as possible, but trust me, it's worth explaining so that you can understand exactly why this volcanic eruption led to the worst flooding events in recent Australian history. Australia has two circumstances that largely dictate its climate. The first is the La Nina El Nino cycle. We're currently in the middle of a La Nina event in Australia. This climate event brings wetter than usual weather to Australia and is just a normal part of the climate here. The climate of Australia cycles between La Nina and El Nino. Without going too much into it, a La Nina is basically cooler than normal ocean temperatures in the eastern Pacific near the equator, and a El Nino is the opposite, with warmer than normal temperatures existing. The second thing that dictates the climate of Australia is the Southern Annular Mode, also known as SAM and this is being directly altered by the volcanic eruption. When defined, SAM is a climate driver that can influence rainfall and temperatures in Australia. 
The SAM refers to a non-seasonal north-south movement of the strong westerly winds that blow almost continuously in the mid to high latitudes of the southern hemisphere. These winds can shift their position and move from north to south depending on a variety of factors that influence this. And this is important because this volcanic eruption has forced the SAM to move and to stay in a southerly position that it normally doesn't remain trapped within for this long, with most SAM events only lasting a fortnight or so compared to the many months that we've seen this year. The SAM around Australia has three different states that it can enter which create a variety of different weather impacts in Australia. A positive, negative and neutral state. The examples I'm about to give you is of SAM in the winter time. In summer the effects are different. But since Australia just came out of winter, it's the most relevant for this video. Typically, when Australia is in an active La Nina cycle, the SAM is in a positive state. This means it will remain south beneath Tasmania and the rains associated with it won't really reach southern Australia as much as it normally would. This shift allows tropical air from the Tasman and Coral Sea to move west creating a dry Victoria, but a very wet New South Wales and Queensland, whilst also allowing a larger percentage of the water saturated wind to move east from the Indian Ocean over Western Australia. A negative SAM is the opposite, it reaches far into the continent, drawing up more wetter and cold weather, but if it moves too far north, then the westerlies blow across the continent, making the western parts of Australia wet and drying it out by the time it approaches the eastern part of the continent meaning little to no rain will be dropped on the east during this event. So it's predominantly the southern annular mode, aka the SAM, that the Tongan volcano has disrupted or amplified as it was already in a positive state because of the La Nina. But it has been amplified by this eruption and I'll explain how in a moment. First, let's take a look at how this happened to begin with. This is Tonga. Here is where the submarine volcano erupted at a magnitude 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. So it released this massive ash plume, which is actually predominantly water, and that's why the colour of it is very white compared to the dark brown or grey to black cloud of ash that most explosive volcanoes release when they erupt on the surface and above the waterline. Now here is a map of the prevailing winds. So when the 58 km high cloud of ash was shot upwards towards the stratosphere, the prevailing winds began to take it in a west to northwest direction and it would travel that way until this little circular current took it south towards southern Australia and the borders of Antarctica, where the massive amount of water vapour would directly contact the southern annular mode. Australia's weather is directly linked to what is going on in the stratosphere over Antarctica and studies have shown that water vapour levels in the southern hemisphere as a whole have increased by 20% following the eruption. And well, you might think that it's this water vapour that's being rained back down onto Australia, but the truth is much more stranger and fascinating because what much of this water vapour is doing is cooling the stratosphere over Antarctica. Temperatures have dropped by around 1 to 3 degrees here and this cold air is strengthening the polar vortex. A polar vortex is just basically the winds that are swirling around Antarctica and SAM is part of these winds. This dramatic cooling and subsequent strengthening of the polar vortex is forcing the southern annular mode or SAM to remain stuck unbelievably close to Antarctica where it is being forced to remain trapped. So the cold temperatures have strengthened the polar vortex which is forcing the positive SAM to hang very low in its reach, to a point that it's almost hugging Antarctica. As a result of this, we are receiving fewer cold fronts from Antarctica, and because these cold fronts aren't travelling north to northeast from Antarctica over Australia like they normally would, much of what we are receiving in terms of weather events and rain are being sourced from the increased easterly winds that have been allowed to dominate now that the SAM is in a lower position. This means we get fewer cold fronts that normally come from Antarctica, affecting an area that stretches from Brisbane down to Hobart, meaning more onshore winds from the ocean are hitting Australia with wetter weather. Normally the easterly winds would be competing with the southern annular mode, and this struggle or tug of war would lead to the more stable weather that we experience in Australia. And I say stable weather in a somewhat joking way because the weather in Australia is never really stable, but this event has led to an anomaly that just isn't part of the normal cycle of our climate. So the southern annular mode is basically being tied to Antarctica. It's not being allowed to drift further north and for months we've been hammered with extremely strange wetter weather than what most of us have ever experienced. The amount of rain has been so bad the ground is oversaturated to the point it has become like a stagnant rotten swamp. 
Like literally, my front and rear lawn has begun to smell rotten as much of the oxygen that normal soil would retain became suffocated, turning the ground anoxic, leading to it smelling quite bad. As the soil has basically turned from aerobic to anaerobic, and a foul, rotten, sulfurous smell is emanating from it as a result. So basically, what this means is we still have a few more months of this La Nina cycle. The water vapour released by the Tongan volcanic eruption is still there doing its thing, but in general, we should only have another two or three months of this in Australia before the La Nina cycle begins to taper and before the SAM is finally liberated from the shackles that the eruption has placed it in. In the next six months, the weather should more or less return to a normal state, whatever that means in this country. But this shows just how far reaching these events are. They've caused extreme chaos in Australia, especially in the southeastern parts of it. Victoria had the worst flooding I've ever seen, and I was actually worried I was going to be flooded out too, since I live in an ancient river channel that has been heavily mined in the past. So now you know why Australia is flooding so badly. And we aren't out of the waters yet. I know, bad pun, but the danger is still there. Now that you know the whys, hopefully it'll help you understand the weather conditions that are forming this, and perhaps it might even help to prevent a flooding disaster to you or your property if you're currently living within one of these parts in Australia that are being drastically affected. I hope that everyone affected by these floods gets back on their feet as soon as possible, and I really feel for the thousands of Australians who lost everything as a result of this. My most heartfelt thoughts go out to you all. And so, this is how the massive volcanic eruption that occurred in Tonga led to some of the worst flooding disasters seen in recent history in Australia. Hopefully something like this doesn't happen again too soon. What's scary is that this eruption was a VEI 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, and Tambora was a VEI 7, an order of magnitude stronger. I can't imagine what would have happened if it was a Tambora event that occurred, but I'm glad it wasn't. A massive rain ban right now sweeping across half the country. Victoria, New South Wales and parts of Queensland all in the firing line. Breaking news on the flood emergency in New South Wales. An evacuation order coming into effect moments ago in Forbes. Residents told to get out now. Wild storms have pounded Melbourne's west and the Mornington Peninsula, flooding homes and stranding drivers. Australia is flooding again. This severe weather event is now in its 63rd day as of the 15th of November. So this is a part two to the first video that I made where I covered why the Tongan volcanic eruption is in part responsible for the inundation of floods that we are witnessing, which is creating chaos in Australia for the many tens to hundreds of thousands of Australian families that are either directly or indirectly affected by these weather events. We have just had another series of massive flooding occur, and much of this rain fell in areas that have already been so profoundly hit by the recent floods that only occurred a few weeks ago. It's gotten so bad that Australia has asked for international help, as the floods amplify in their intensity with no signs of slowing down. A dam overflow has just occurred in New South Wales in the past 24 hours too, and it's been described as looking like an inland tsunami in its appearance travelling downstream towards the many nearby towns, smashing into them with force before inundating them and ultimately decimating the towns, leaving little time for residents to escape. Some of the footage of this dam spillover is truly spectacular and very terrifying. The unrelenting torrent of water is seemingly never ending. For many flood affected residents, the only way out is via a helicopter, and this is obviously causing many issues, as there are a limited number of them to begin with, and there's such a widespread area that's been affected by these floods, leading to slower rescues, and to people and their pets being stranded for hours in any place that they can find relief from the muddy wet chaos that gushes with intensity all around them. Prior to this set of floods, the ground was so saturated that all it took was one heavy downpour to cause the type of life-threatening flash flood that we have experienced overnight and into today. So this episode will allow me to further document the effects that are happening in real time right before your eyes here, and they perfectly illustrate the effect that the volcanically influenced positive SAM, La Nina, and the negative Indian Ocean Dipole is having on Australia. I didn't elaborate on the Indian Ocean Dipole, also known as IOD, in the last video, and for a good reason. The video was confusing enough for the many people who were just being introduced to the concepts explained, and I decided to omit it to save the time and sanity of our viewers. 
I did this because the Tongan volcanic eruption affected the southern annular mode and not the La Nina or the Indian Ocean Dipole. The video was purely about the effects that the volcanic eruption had on the climate and what it and it alone contributed to the flooding in Australia. Which is why my emphasis was on explaining the SAM correctly. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is happening right now in Australia. We have some alarming things occurring, and this looks like it's going to be another bad one. But in an attempt to find a positive in a situation where there is largely only negatives, this is a perfect time to explain how the positive SAM is amplifying these effects by not being able to influence the climate of Australia in the same way that it normally would if it was in a less positive, neutral or slightly negative state. So let's take our tinfoil hats off and go over the natural phenomenon occurring here that is creating these issues. Welcome to Ausgeographics. Let's start with the Indian Ocean Dipole. This is where the majority of the rain that is hammering the southeastern states all the way to Victoria is coming from. This is not the source of New South Wales and Queensland's rains. This will predominantly hit South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. The Indian Ocean Dipole exists in three different states, similar to SAM, a positive, negative and neutral state. During the recent floods, we've been in a negative Indian Ocean Dipole state. When it's negative, westerly winds intensify, allowing warmer waters to concentrate near Australia. These stronger winds also mean it's harder for cool water to rise up from the deep near Indonesia. As these warmer waters move east, the clouds follow, favouring weather patterns that ultimately bring rain, drenching southern Australia. On the flip side, if it's positive, westerly winds weaken, and if they're weakened enough, sometimes easterly winds will form, allowing warm water to shift towards Africa. When this happens, Africa is at a massive risk of experiencing flooding. South of Indonesia, these changes in the winds allow cool waters to rise up from the ocean depths. With cooler waters and descending air in the eastern Indian Ocean, less clouds form. This changes the path of weather systems coming from Australia's west, often meaning less rain over central and southeast areas. Australia becomes drier as a result, and bushfires become way more common. When we experienced the devastating bushfires in 2019, this was during a positive Indian Ocean dipole state. A neutral state really isn't worth explaining because it has little influence on Australia's climate. The Indian Ocean dipole will usually begin in autumn or winter, and it can last for three to five years before it swings from positive to negative and back again. But it normally returns to a neutral state around the end of spring, when the Northern Australian monsoon arrives where it will largely remain until the following autumn or winter kicks it back into a positive or negatively dominated state. So this is why we are receiving so much rain in the affected areas, which is kind of amazing in a way because this runs contrary to what should happen to Victoria or South Australia in a positive SAM, which normally makes New South Wales and Queensland wet, but keeps the southern areas dry. But the negative Indian Ocean Dipole is balancing this by being the factor that is drenching these parts instead. So Victoria is obviously also flooding, not because the SAM is bringing wet weather from Antarctica like it normally would, but because the negative Indian Ocean Dipole is pushing wet weather across the country in a southeasterly direction from Western Australia down to Hobart. And it is really being pushed by the subtropical ridge, which is a belt of high pressure systems that circles the Southern Hemisphere's mid latitudes. So there really is a perfect storm going on here. Now I need to address something that's probably going to annoy a lot of viewers. Now I don't care about the politics, I only care about the science, and global warming will make floods more pronounced and more intense. Think about it guys, seriously, all politics aside, a La Nina, which is a natural phenomenon, creates all this intense wet weather in Australia because it's a phase where we get warmer than normal ocean temperatures in the north to northeast of Australia. So if the ocean is a little warmer than usual on top of the La Nina, this will cause greater than normal evaporation meaning more clouds and more rains. It's not rocket science guys, honestly, even if it's just 0.1 degrees Celsius higher or 0.00005 degrees Celsius higher than what it otherwise would have been as a direct result of human activity, that's still 0.00005 or 0.1 degrees higher than what it otherwise would have been. This is the only time I'm going to mention this because it's not causing these events, it's adding to it. The volcanic eruption also did not cause these events, it added to it. 
These events would have happened regardless of if it was now or 70,000 years ago. If Australia is in a positive SAM with a strong La Nina and a negative Indian Ocean Dipole, we're going to get major flooding. These factors can amplify it, and they most likely are. So let's summarize this video. We have the following situations going on. The La Nina is bringing in wetter than normal weather, drenching New South Wales and Queensland. Multi-year La Nina conditions that developed in September 2020 continue to prevail up to this point near the end of 2022. A typical La Nina El Nino cycle starts in the first half of the year and lasts until the following autumn. Sometimes we can get the same phase for two or more years in a row. On average, it takes about four years to swing from La Nina to El Nino and back again. Now the positive SAM has been amplified to remain positive by the volcanic eruption that occurred in Tonga in January of 2022. It's forcing winds to stay closer to Antarctica. Now I explained this in the last video, but it basically means little to no north to northeasterly fronts are rising from Antarctica and hitting the southeastern regions of Australia like they normally would. As a result of this, two things are happening. The negative Indian Ocean Dipole is able to push across the continent freely, riding along the highly pressurized subtropical ridge. And the Indian Ocean Dipole takes over as the predominant climate factor because it is unopposed by the SAM, which is stuck in Antarctica, keeping the winds there very low to the point that they don't reach Australia as they move from west to east. As a result of this, the IOD is the dominant driver, and it's pushing massive rain southeast across Australia. But on top of this, the wind currents that circulate around the shorelines of South Australia are also adding to this, and bringing massive amounts of rain from the oceans that they are passing over and dumping it over Australia. Let's take a quick look at a map of the wind current directions in Australia. You can see why eastern Australia is getting so smashed by rains, and how the southern parts are getting increased rain as a direct result of more onshore winds being able to more freely circulate because the SAM is stuck in a positive position. And along with that, this means that New South Wales and Queensland are getting hammered by the onshore winds that are passing from east to west, and some parts of northern Victoria are also being affected by the massive rains that these fronts are bringing, mainly in those areas that are bordered by the massive Murray River system, and this is happening because of the wind currents. Much like the southern parts, because the SAM is not the dominant front here, more tropical air is able to drift south from Queensland towards the lower reaches of New South Wales bringing more onshore easterly winds than normal now that the SAM isn't here to contend with. Now it's worth mentioning that there are other factors that influence Australia's climate, such as the Madden-Julian Oscillation, or MJO. But what's mentioned in this video are the main set of circumstances that are driving the climactic mayhem that we are witnessing. So this is why Australia is flooding so heavily in its most natural sense. Now, let's put our tinfoil hats back on. Many people will mention weather manipulation, and whilst it's a fact that humans have been actively experimenting with this, that topic and video is better suited to a person who is passionate about discussing those kinds of things. I'm passionate about natural sciences, and that's why my focus is on the events that led to this and how they relate to the massive Tongan volcanic eruption witnessed in January of 2022. Now, speaking of natural sciences, check out the erosive damage the floods caused. The force of the water is unbelievable. Now we know why gold moves in a flood, and that's probably one of the only positive outcomes of this situation. People are going to go nuts of their metal detectors, and will probably see some pretty amazing discoveries of some gold nuggets that were previously buried beneath the earth prior to the floods exposing them. Thanks for watching.